Um, so that's my name, uh, Xavier Gordas. It goes in French, actually, Xavier. Uh, I'm uh, doing a postdoctoral research uh, at WITS for about a year now. And uh, I came here to talk to you about Puff Adder. So I found actually a quite catchy title, <coughs> Portrait of an African Killer. Uh, why do they actually uh, call them an African killer? It's because statistically speaking, the puff adder is the most dangerous snake in, South, in Africa altogether. It means that it actually causes the most human fatalities on the whole African continent uh, 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 per year. Uh, now, statistics can actually sometimes be misleading and uh, give the wrong impression. And I will actually get back to that statement at the end of my talk. But for now, what I'm going to talk about is about the research projects that have been conducted for about a year now and that focuses on uh, the effect of food on mating activity and reproductive success in the puff adder. So this is actually uh, a pure research uh, program, uh, but I'm also involved in some conservation through environmental education. All right, so uh, a brief introduction of myself. I'm actually French. Uh, I got my bachelor's degree in my hometown of Lyon, France in 2000, after which I actually uh, emigrated to the United States for about 12 years, where I did a few things, uh, including getting a Master of Science and also getting a PhD uh, from Las Vegas. So you can actually get things done in Las Vegas. I'm getting proof of it. I graduated with my PhD in 2010, at which point uh, I taught there for a couple of years, and I was actually arrived in South Africa for the first time exactly a year ago. This is me here, quite happy. How do we get the, the little, yeah, the red, the, okay, super. Uh, me here in the Sonoran Desert of uh, Arizona, uh, thrilled to be in an area where I could actually uh, spot a mountain lion, the cougars, pumas, and things like this. Anyway, today uh, I am at, uh, at Vitz working with Professor Graham Alexander, which is actually one of the most famous uh, uh, African, uh, snake, uh, African snake ecologists who works at Vitz. So I will be using I and we, referring to Graham and I, uh, working uh, together on this project. Uh, my research interests uh, are actually quite varied, but I have to, if I have to narrow it down to something, I, I like animals and I like to study the behavior and the evolutionary ecology. So uh, to put it uh, in some kind of main terms, what it is, is I actually like to monitor the behaviors of animals. And uh, then the next step is actually to understand how the expression of some behaviors uh, 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 relate to the, uh, an organism's fitness. There's two themes that I'm actually quite fond of in that kind of discipline of behavioral ecology, mating systems and reproduction and predator-prey relationships and foraging. So I'm actually really thrilled to be a, in, uh, in South Africa to conduct that project that I designed myself because it actually, the project I've been conducting actually takes uh, uh, aspects from both of those themes. All right, so let's get to the current study. Uh, what it is, it's an experimental field study of behavior uh, of, in, of puff adders uh, in Gauteng, okay? Uh, the study is actually taking location in uh, Dino King Game Reserve. Sorry, the map's a little small. So we're about 50 kilometers north of here. Huh. Before I actually tell you what the objective of the study is, uh, I'm just going to give you a little background information on viper systems. I've actually been studying vipers, uh, many, a few species, for the last 13 years. Uh, uh, vipers mating system, what happens is typically the males during the mating season, the males are actually looking for the females, okay? So the females find a nice spot uh, where they're relatively safe and the males are actually go typically berserk. They cover great distances to be able to find those females. Uh, another thing, another characteristic of the mating system of vipers is uh, they are polygynous, okay? Meaning that they it's not uh, a mandatory, but a male will actually go and, and copy it with several females if he has the opportunity, the opportunity. And females will also do that, okay? A single female could actually copy it with several males within a single mating season. Now, what's really interesting is that uh, uh, those animals actually have what we call multiple paternity. A multiple paternity is a phenomenon in which a female will actually have uh, produce one litter, and within that litter, it actually uh, does uh, all the offsprings are, could be from different fathers, if you will. Okay, so this is called multiple paternity, and this is actually the rule rather than the exception in most reptiles. Okay, so it actually makes it very interesting to understand to try to figure out which male is actually the one that father most of the kids. Okay. So, uh, with that background in mind, uh, the research actually tells the hypothesis that food intake affects a male's investment in mate-searching activities and reflective success. 
Okay, but what does that mean? In other words, we're testing the hypothesis that males that are better fed, okay, we're talking about other male buffeters, those that are better fed will actually have uh, an increased uh, energy and they will actually be able to allocate that energy towards finding more females. So how do they actually find more females? Well, the one hypothesis is that they actually increase the rate at which they're moving, which increases female encounter rate, the number of females that they copulate with, and therefore enhances their reproductive success. Okay, meaning they will actually father more offspring. So that's all rational. So the methods are actually pretty simple. I'm sure uh, most of you here in South Africa know about radio telemetry. Okay, uh, what we have is we have a transmitter. Uh, we have a variety of them. Those actually cost quite a lot of money. But each transmitter emits a specific radio frequency. Uh, so we're not dealing with megafauna, no lions, no rhinos, just a simple little puff adder. So we don't put a radio collar on it, on it and there's no, there's no satellite technology, okay? Uh, what we do is we simply actually put that little thing, the transmitter, which is a 13 gram unit, it's about that size, okay? like this, and we actually go through a full-blown surgery pr procedure. So uh, I catch the snakes, and then I go back to vets uh, with my snakes, and I get a team with a vet and animal caretakers. Uh, we put the snake to sleep, okay, with anesthetic gases, so we actually intubate it down the windpipe. We feed it uh, isoflurane, the anesthetic gases. The snake goes to sleep, and then the surgeon, the vet, can actually go, make a cut at the posterior part of the body, cut the skin, cut the muscle, introduce the transmitter, sew back the muscle, sew back the skin, and the snake is ready to go, okay? So, uh, now, we've got a snake, we put a transmitter into it, we release the snake, the only thing I need is a receiver and an antenna. I have in my left hand here a receiver. What you do is simply, you actually just put the radio frequency of the snake you want to find. Remember that each transmitter has got its own specific radio frequency, you plug it in, you plug that number, you kind of, you know, walk around your antenna and you're hopefully hearing for a nice sound that does a beep, beep, beep. The antenna actually goes, you use the antenna to guide you towards the direction where the sound is the most intense, which will eventually uh, allow you to actually locate the animal. Now, uh, every time the snake is actually found in a different location, I record a GPS coordinate. And then uh, movement analysis or mating activity in this case here can actually be analyzed in a geographic information system, which is a GIS. You import the GPS coordinate and you got some software that will actually calculate the straight line distance between each consecutive point. So it's the easy part of the data collection. Uh, so the tracking can begin. I'll give you a second, try to find a puff feather. I'm not sure it's a big guy, it's a kilogram, it's above a meter, but they blend remarkably well. Uh, it is right here, okay? It's right here. There is no photo manipulation, there is nothing. This is it. This is a male here. It's in an ambush position, you know, partially shaded by a grass, grass clump here. Uh, uh, they have uh, the ability to blend in, and this is quite amazing, really. Another example, I'll give you a second to find the snake. It's actually right in the center, okay? They had the ability to almost fully disappear. They like to, to bury themselves partly, at least in the lift litter, and uh, they're waiting for, you know, a prey, or, or they're actually just fairly, uh, you know, either obviously to try to catch prey or to evade predators, and they do that quite often. Okay, so, um, I've explained to you how I actually follow the snakes around. How do I quantify mating activity, the movement pattern? It's the easy part. Now, how do I actually manipulate food, okay, in wild animals? Well, um, what I did is uh, I've actually collected data for one full season. So I started in October 2012, which is pretty much the time where the snakes are coming back, you know, to becoming active. And uh, from October 2012 to June 2013 was my first field season. So I, I was done, I actually done with it for the, uh, for the first field season. Now, in January of 2013, so about you know, nine months ago, I actually had uh, uh, 11 adult males with transmitters inside of them. So what did I do? I actually partitioned randomly those males that I had into two groups. Okay? And that actually, those males will constitute, if you will, the basis for the research program. 
So what do we have? Some of those males will actually be uh, uh, were allocated to what we are called the fed group, which is called the experimental treatment, and the other ones will be used as control and uh, therefore are unfed. Okay, and that actually allows me uh, in science when we have a control, uh, that means that what do we have? Okay, I'm just trying to. Uh, the control snakes are left to their own. Okay, they're in the field, they feed on their own, and they actually allow scientists to give us the baseline data. Okay, that we can compare it with uh, when it comes to feeding, for example. Okay, so we use the control male, they feed on their own, they roam on their own, they do whatever they want. Now the snakes that are allocated to the fed group, what do I do is actually they are back in the felt. Okay? I put the transmitter, I release them exactly where, the, where I caught them and I let them be and I follow them around. Now what I do is actually I provide them food every week. So that means I actually come, I take a snake tongue, uh, you know, which is about a meter long, I get my bag of dead mice, okay, I take the mice and I just offer, offer, offer the mice to the snakes and typically they take it. So how? Huh, uh, those snakes that were that are actually were allocated to fed group, so uh, for about a two month period I visit those guys and uh, actually uh, once a week each one of them is offered about 15% of its own body mass in, in thawed striped mice. Okay, so the, uh, the striped mice are actually a Rhabdomys pumilio, it's a native rodent that lives around here. Uh, uh, Vitz uh, researcher is actually doing behavior, behavioral studies on them and they sacrifices them humanely at the end of, the, of his study and therefore we actually recycle the mice. <laughs> <laughs> now, snakes that are in the fed group get up to 15% of their own body mass uh, uh, of mice per week. Now, uh, when we actually wrote, uh, when I actually wrote a proposal to get to get here to the project and get a fellowship, uh, I didn't know if, whether those guys would actually take dead food from a, you know, kind of a friendly Frenchman, I guess. You know, uh, it turned out that they did. Uh, but uh, here, I'll just show you. It's about a two-minute video. Uh, so what I did in this case, I simply just uh, went there, grabbed my mice, and just uh, put it in front of it. He struck it, and then he is just busy swallowing it. I need to put some Jaws music to this. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's supposed to be sound, but I don't know if there's a speaker. <laughs> Actually, uh, now that we talk, we have the image, I'll make the sound. What is really cool about snakes is that they have a unique way of feeding, which is called a pterygoid walk. Pterygoid is actually refers to one of those bones they have on their uh, upper jaw. They literally actually, they don't get their food into their mouth. They actually walk over their food with their jaws. Okay? What it is is those bones that have those hooks inside the mouth are actually, you know, dragged over the prey. So the snake really drags itself over, over the prey, which is unique among all animals. So most snake, all snakes have very flexible jaws and they actually uh, do not have a bone that connects each side of their lower jaw which actually allows them to, to uh, swallow uh, their prey whole and, 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 and you know, meals of, of quite a large size. And then once that point when the prey is down, uh, is down the mouth of the throat, they actually use gravity and also the muscular, you know, all the muscles, uh, by either contracting the muscles in the neck to actually, to actually pass down the prey down the, the elementary canal. As you can see, it's going to be very easy from now on. You can see the contraction, uh, and uh, that will actually funnel the prey down in the stomach. <laughs> Look at that, you see? That's the way muscular contraction that passes through the mouse down the, down the body. He knows I'm here. He's watching me from one eye, I'm telling you. That. 
<coughs> but I'm standing still. Anyway, uh, that's a really cool video. Now, uh, the good thing is that it didn't only happen once, and most snakes were actually quite, uh, uh, quite uh, eager to feed. They were good feeders. So what we have here is actually the six snakes that were uh, in the feeding treatment, okay, uh, that's their ID, identification number, and then that's the start of their feeding trial. So what I did is actually try to, to feed them for about two months prior to the mating season so that the feeding is significant enough that, you know, we can actually uh, claim that the fed snakes have actually gotten more food than the ones that were unfed. So the start date typically was in January, but I also had a couple of more males a little further down, uh, simply because I just wanted to increase my sample size. And uh, it uh, may sound funny to you, but actually when you're you know, coming from, uh, it's actually quite difficult to find buff feathers, although they are locally abundant. Uh, so um, I was able to actually have a few more after I uh, started the feeding trial. Uh, the initial way of the snake, there's actually quite some variation, which makes it very interesting. Okay, one of the smallest is about 350 gram here, so that is a very, uh, it's a, a, a newly mature male. It's a, it's a pretty small, and we go all the way up to 1.3 kilo, which is the guy that we just saw on the video here, which is about about you know 1.1 meter tall length or something. Like that. So this is quite nice to have that variation. And then here, uh, what we have is the amount of food that they actually ingested during that feeding period of two months, okay, or a little less for the last two snakes. So what we have here, for instance, we've got BIT1, BIT stands for bitus, that's the genus name of, 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 that, of the puff pattern. Uh, uh, here, that weighed about 965 grams, so that means that a guy ate about 90% of his own body mass in striped mice, so he roughly, you know, ate about 850 to 900 grams of mice that was offered, that I offered him. So that was pretty cool. Uh, an update on the current situation. Dead, dead, dead. The first one was eaten, uh, uh, the f was eaten the day after I found him copulating with a female, so mating can be very dangerous. Uh, uh, what do we have? This one, GIT15, was actually uh, swallowed by a brown snake eagle, so I actually can claim and brag about the fact that actually I radio tracked a brown snake eagle once in my life. Uh, uh, Brown snake eagles swallow their snake uh, whole, okay, which most other eagles would not do it, so eventually the transmitter was uh, inside the stomach of the brown snake eagle, and that thing actually drove me crazy for about two hours trying to figure out <laughs> what was going on with the feathers. <laughs> but I eventually figured out there was a brown snake eagle that flew over me, and I said, oh, crap. <laughs> Uh, BIT18, that's the guy we saw on video, was eaten about two to three weeks ago uh, during the winter. I'm not sure what ate it, but I believe it may be a cobra. Now, uh, you may not be aware of it. They're highly venomous. They're highly dangerous. They are. That's the fact. But they are actually sissies. Sissies when it comes to surviving the bush, really. They have very low, uh, uh, they have very low survival. Uh, pretty much anything actually can eat a puff adder. Uh, uh, I've tracked 40 adult snakes in the last 11 months, 12, 11 months more to be actually more factual, and 14 of these uh, puff adders, including big ones like this that are over a kilo get eaten. Main predators are gonna be some carnivores like jackals, uh, honey badgers, caracals. Uh, the cobras are always a problem. Cobras love to feed on puff adders of all species. Uh, the snarly cobra that grows that, that's around here that gets pretty big is one of the, the top predators um, of, 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 of puff adders. And, uh, and uh, what else? And the snake eagles are also problematic, as the name can imply. Uh, now, uh, three of those snakes, of the 14 snakes that died, three were also uh, actually uh, death were caused to human-related causes, uh, run over by a car, which is really not in common for snakes, okay? Uh, uh, killed in an electric fence, and also killed by, uh, by some dogs in the backyard property. Okay, so. So you may wonder, how do I know that uh, those uh, snakes that are in the fed group actually get more food than those that are in the control group? Well, I don't know that really, uh, because I have no clue what is the natural feeding rates of those organisms in nature. I'm actually right now working on a, a video camera system that will actually uh, let me, that will actually tell me what is the natural feeding rates in nature. But at this point, I don't have that. So one way to actually demonstrate that the snakes that are in the fed group actually get more food than those that were in the unfed group is, is to at change is to look at changes in body mass. So what do we have here on the x-axis? We've got the groups, the fed males, the unfed males, and here on the y-axis we've got growth in percentage of uh, initial body mass. So the unfed snake, uh, uh, 
actually did not exhibit any change in body mass overall. They stayed the same during that two month period of feeding trials, okay? So it started in early January and it ended in, 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 in mid-March. And those snakes that were in the unfed group did not uh, change body mass. On the other hand, those that were in the fed treatment actually exhibited a 40% uh, you know, 40% uh, growth in body mass uh, on average. So it actually shows you that the snakes that were fed did get more food. So sorry, the academic side, the statistics that we rely on. Okay, so uh, I fed those snakes for a two month period and the end of the feeding actually coincided with the beginning of the mating season. Uh, uh, so uh, that's actually the meat of the study, if you will. Okay? I manipulate the food intake of the males for a two month period prior to mating season and I want to see how it affects their mating activity during the mating season. Now I drop all my mice, the only thing I do is a full time job, trust me, is to follow about you know, a bunch of buffetos in the felt. So I regular track snakes every day. Uh, I didn't really know where, how long was the main season. I was kind of anticipating one month and a half, tops, things like this. Turned out it was three months. So for three months, every single day, I spent about 10 hours in the felt. It took me quite a few months afterwards to recover from this experience, to be honest. You know, uh, I'm a passionate and all that stuff, but when there's too much work, you need to. It, it actually is quite. Um, Quite, uh, quite, what do you say, tiring and draining, but fantastic data. Now, why do I actually want to go and track my snake on a daily basis? Well, it's very important because I, wanted, I do want to generate top notch data. Okay. And, uh, well, going out to track your snakes every day will actually provide you the best, you know, the best estimate of movement activity. All right. Um, the second thing, too, is you don't want to keep, you don't want to lose track of your snakes. Okay. Uh, during the mating season, a uh, puff adder actually showed the maximum distance that one puff adder, adult puff adder actually moved was 1.5 kilometer overnight. Okay? Now think about it, if you actually just go and track your snake once every three to four days, the potential for your snakes to be about 10 kilometers, 8 to 10 kilometers away from the previous known location is here. Okay? Well, there's limits to the technology we're using. We don't have satellite. We just have like little antenna. And the uh, antenna has a range limit, okay, which can go from a few hundred meters to, uh, under the best circumstances, can pick up a signal about you know, maybe a kilometer. So when you lose a snake, you don't want to lose a snake, but when you lose a snake, you've got to go around in the bush kind of randomly, you know, try to find a spot, find spots, stop, try to find you know, a nice signal to hear, and then you need to keep track of that. Anyway, uh, that's the reason why I actually decided to do this every day. And there's a second reason too, I wanted to radio track those snakes every day, is also because I need to keep track of the females that they encounter during their mating activity. Okay, this is central to this study, okay, uh, because there's an easy way to quantify how much they move, but now I also want to be able to quantify how does it affect their fitness or their reproductive success, which is very interesting. Okay, so how did we do that? Uh, how, how, will, how, how are we going to be uh, uh, quantifying reproductive success? Um, so I follow my males on a daily basis during the mating season. I found a female that I'm unaware of. Okay, I've never met that female. That female has no transmitter. So I take that female. Uh, if they're copulating, I will wait patiently because snakes actually take quite a long time to do their business. So it could be a couple of hours. I wait for them to separate. I pick up the female, put it in a box, and I bring it back uh, to the lodge where I'm staying overnight. And I glue a transmitter onto its back. Super glue. Does the trick. Okay. A little, it's a little chip. It's two grams. It really is nothing uh, for the snake. And I just super glue it to the back of the snake. Okay. Uh, now there's limits to that technique. The first one is that the transmitter can uh, rip off. It's happened on a couple of occasions. Uh, I was actually able to catch those females back by, by monitoring the behavior of the males. Uh, three to four times a day I would come to check on those males that I knew were in the vicinity of the lost females were. And I was able to catch all the females back. Uh, so that's one, one problem is that they can rip off. And the other one too is the snake will shed. Okay? Mm -hmm. And the snake will shed it and it will shed the, the, shed the transmitter with it. So that's just a temporary solution, okay? But uh, it's good because it allows me to actually minimize uh, my interference on mating activity. I catch the female, I bring it back to, to my can, I put the transmitter onto her with glue, and I release it the day after. Now you may wonder, well, but will the snake be there? Yeah, well, yeah, the puff headers are a great system for that. And as a matter of fact, most viper, because the male will be standing there and waiting for the female to come back. So that's great. <laughs> so, 
they do their business during the main activity at the end of the mating season. I'm actually catching those female puffetters that have their gluon transmitters, return to back, and we go for a full body cavity implant. Now there's no more risk of losing the snake, okay? And I feel much better. Uh, and what we do, we release, I release them back into the field, and I wait, uh, we wait for them to be ready to drop their youngs which is gonna be in about a few months coming. So uh, they give birth, they mate here, at least in, North, in, a, in a hot tank, they mate, the puffers typically mate from, uh, from mid-March mid to mid-June. Uh, the females will actually store the sperm in their structures, okay? And uh, they will actually uh, ovulate and fertilization will occur sometime uh, around October, November. Then there will be about a three month gestation period and they will drop live youngs sometime in February. So we have, do not have any quantification of reproductive success at this point simply because the females are still in the felt and they're uh, just with their babies are developing inside of their bellies. Now what the plan is, is um, the way we are gonna do those uh, quantification of reproductive success is that every single male that's part of the study <coughs> will take a little tissue sample and we will be able to genotype it, uh, every single one of them. Now when all those baby offspring, those babies, uh, puff headers are gonna be born, we will take a scale clip, so we'll take a, you know, uh, it's a non-destructive kind of, uh, of, of the method, we'll take a little piece of scale and we'll run paternity analysis on all offspring and hopefully we'll be able to match with the right father, okay? So we will be able to tell how many babies each male that's in the study is actually being able to, to father, which is quite cutting edge, in fact. Okay, I'll show you quite a quick video. I've got a four, four minutes to go. This is a female puff adder laying here. She's standing still, and there's a male that's courting her right here. So they have that jerky kind of motion, they're interested, they kind of rub their chin onto the female's back uh, and they tongue flick. That's one of, the snake, one of the things that snakes do the best is tongue flicking. He's actually very excited, he can pick up the pheromones that are produced by the female that says I'm receptive, okay. Uh, however, actually I may be wrong, but I believe that that guy did, was not lucky. She seems very, very uh, uh, she seems that uh, she showed very little interest, as you can see. Anyway, <laughs> sorry, I'm an expert in snake reproduction. I'm quite excited about those things. <laughs> All right, so that's pretty cool. I was able to record many, many female-male interactions, uh, about 20, 20 plus of them, of independent, different interactions. So uh, um, the, the project is really looking really great. Okay, so let's get down to, to business and talk about that hypothesis we, we actually formulated, which is fed male will actually show, exhibit an increased investment in mate searching activities. Okay. So here on the x-axis is the same thing. We've got the two groups. We've got the fed males on the left and the unfed males on the right. Here on the y-axis is the total distance covered by the males during the mating season that just ended in June here. Okay, so if we start with those that are actually unfed, so the control, uh, they travel on average, those that were unfed travel on average 4.5 kilometers. So it's actually quite, uh, uh, it's quite significant for our puff feathers that are called, you know, they're, they're fat, <coughs> lazy, and all that stuff, but the males are actually, uh, uh, they're, they're investing quite a lot of effort in trying to find females. Now, it does not compare to what the males that were fed actually did because they doubled the amount of investment they made in searching for females and the average was around nine kilometers over a three month period. Now, this is an average. Uh, the record is held, uh, currently held by a, a, uh, one of the fed males that was actually very small and that traveled 15 kilometers in three months. I'm telling you that when you actually have 15 snakes to follow like this that are moving at <laughs> such a crazy rate, you go crazy. <laughs> but uh, that is in support of uh, the hypothesis we formulated. We're quite excited, really. This is a kind of quite a, a unique study because uh, there's that experimental film uh, manipulation, which is really, you know, which is actually not that common. And, and we have some top-notch data that's coming out of this research. Uh, so it's very cool. What you can see here, we actually have uh, here. This is a. Uh, Academics like to refer to statistics. P should be at 0.05 or less to actually be statistically significant. We're close to it. The reason why we actually have just P 0.07 is because our sample size is pretty small. Now we are. I've started my second field season. I believe actually that the rain we got this morning in Dino King may actually be the trigger uh, that will actually bring them back to activity. Um, 
but we're hoping to uh, to be able to do it. We starting. We have a little funds to do and, and do a second field season. But since I'm here, I'll take advantage of the crowd to say that we need about 50,000 rand to be able to complete the total project. Okay, it's mostly for petroleum money. So if you know of any organization that would be willing to sponsor uh, completely or partially, please let me know and talk to me uh, afterwards. That would be really cool. Really well appreciated. Okay, so we don't know the reproductive success of the males yet. Again, simply because the females have not given birth yet. But what we can look at is how fed and unfed males have a different female encounter rate. Okay. Now, the fed males, five out of six, okay, so pretty much almost all the fed males uh, were actually observed by me, okay, with at least one female. Okay, so the males that were fed typically found one or more female. And it's actually not the case with the unfed male, where actually only four out of the seven male were found with females. Okay? So I don't want to hurry up and uh, just make any kind of conclusion based on that. We will see what happens in the next year and when, when the babies are dropped. But it kind of gives us an indication that it may indeed uh, possibly also relate to reproductive success, meaning that those that are, invest, that are actually better fed invest more in mate searching activity and may also uh, be able to engender uh, father more offspring. So we don't see clearly which is actually uh, a female pattern and male copulating here. Uh, if you didn't know, snakes actually have two penises, such as, such as uh, lizards too, and they actually use them alternatively. <laughs> okay, now my study is actually pure research, but I'm involved in conservation, okay? Uh, and you know that snakes get a bad rap, okay? Uh, typically because, uh, because some of them are actually dangerous, uh, because they're venomous. Now, the majority of snakes are actually not venomous, okay? Uh, but uh, uh, snakes, snakes, yeah, snakes are, well, actually, snakes kind of provoke extreme reaction. They're snake lovers, and there are people that hate snakes. Okay. There's typically no real middle ground for this. There's just two extremes. Okay. And so for the last uh, year, I've been in the Dino King Game Reserve and I've been involved in, in, in trying to change that negative attitude uh, you know, that snakes have toward people, that, toward, that people have towards snakes. Uh, and uh, a lot of it is just to, about establishing facts rather than you know, relying on myths and, and lies also about how, how, how the snakes are actually mean or evil spirited. Okay? There's no such thing. You know, the, the, probably one of the only evil spirited species on planet Earth is humans. You know, uh, people don't know that. Many people don't realize that. You know, uh, but what it is is um, I've actually I'm daily you know and I'm on a daily basis I'm in the field and I interact with landowners. You know that graciously actually let me radio track my buffaloes onto their land. Some of them I'm actually able to actually I convince them to let me release the buffalo where I caught it, which is just you know right in the garden there. At first they're a little shaky, it's just, ah you know I don't know about that and I just well you know. Uh, you know, you remove one buffalo, there may be other tents that you're not aware of, that's right there in your garden. That kind of changes their minds and things like this. And it turns out that in the end, those people are just very thrilled. They're waiting for me typically every day. I come here and we go check those buffaloes together. They're in your garden. Obviously, if you have kids and dogs, it can become a little more problematic. But, um, but I, I, I'm actually quite, quite surprised by, the, by the, the, the response I've had from people uh, you know, in the Dino Kingdom region. It was really, really cool. And I also do some field excursions sometimes. I like to take people in the field. Okay, 60 kilometers here. Uh, you can actually, one of the best demonstrations, we can be swoosh sometimes actually to have somebody pet a wamp of feather. Now, you may call it stupid, but actually I think it's something that's pretty strong and actually conveys the point that those guys are really not mean. Okay, so here you actually have a person that's actually petting a uh, path adder in the felt on the back. Okay, you do that under some kind of control settings, you know, uh, but they don't react, they don't do anything. So to get back about that African killer, so we have statistics shows us that this is the most dangerous snake on the African continent. Um, uh, so that could lead us to believe that they're mean and evil spirited, but they're not. They're, I've been working, you know, I've only been here for a year, uh, and there's at least one organism I know about that here is the puff adder. I've handled and found about 40 to 50 of them, and they're really placid and well behaved. You would not believe it. I've been working on a variety of venomous snake species in America and things like this, and I've actually never really found the species to be aggressive. Okay. Uh, now, what causes that statistics? Okay, of, that portrays the buffalo as an African killer. Well, there are at least three main reasons. The first one 
is that they're, they're locally abundant. You may not see them very often, okay, because they're really well camouflaged, and for most time of the year they do not do much, but they're there, they're locally abundant, so that you know, has a tendency to increase human uh, snake interaction. The second thing is that they like to get into trouble. They like to get into trouble because they love to be around human habitation. Okay? There's two simple reasons for that, food and color. Rats and mice and protection from predators. Okay? Why wouldn't they like to be laying under a piece of tin that's you know, laying in your backyard or you know, in, uh, in a piece of your building where you have rats and mice that are running all day around? Of course, that, you know, they want to be there. And uh, the third reason why they are uh, the most dangerous snake in Africa is because they are actually relying on camouflage. Okay? Meaning the, that they, once they actually feel threatened, their tendency is to stand still. But they have evolved to be like this. Their pattern, their behavior, you know, their morphology, their, their, their pattern makes them, uh, you know, um, so camouflaged that they actually just sit still and they're just hoping to go undetected. Okay? So that means that people are walking around, whether that's in their farm or in fell, will actually get close to them. And that's what makes them relatively more dangerous than cobras and mambas, for instance. Okay? Cobras and mambas, if they're in the open ground, okay, if they're not cornered, a cobra and a mamba will go the other way from which you're coming. Okay? You have like 10 seconds to see it, it will disappear, it's done. The puff adder will be laying there, just hoping to be undetected. Okay. And that's where uh, there's a lot of, of pathetic human interaction that happens. In some cases, the person gets too close, or even actually just step on the snake, and the snake uh, can actually bite. Now, uh, uh, I actually believe the things with statistics and things like that is we always hear the bad side of the story. We always hear about the statistics of the person getting bitten, okay? Because the person knows she got bit, he or she got bit. What we don't know is how many times people are just walking around Stepping on or stepping right by a puff ladder, never see it, so there's nothing to be reported. Okay. We don't know that. All right? uh, and I actually, uh, I don't have data to show that, but uh, I believe that in most, on most cases, you would actually step right next to a puff ladder and you would actually just lay still and not do anything. With this, I'm just going to thank a bunch of people. Uh, and. Uh, that's about it. Thank you for inviting me. I want to thank Naxa and specifically Anne Mearns for inviting me to come give the talk here. Thank you.